Okay, right, audio works. That's cool. Love that. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate you. Uh, especially with a ugly little rainy day like this. So, thank you all for being here. I hate giving lecture to an empty room. <clears throat> Damn. Okay, well, sorry, it's time for me to sharpen up and get ready for a lecture. Um, <laughs> the gray skies are having an effect on me too. Trust if I was in your shoes, I probably wouldn't be here. So I really do appreciate you all coming in. Um, so, Exception handling. So basically, let's set the stage a little bit for today um, and then jump into it. Um, I might have a little demo code today, but it might just be purely lecture, and we will do a full-scale demo on Tuesday after the weekend. So I might just save these concepts being demoed for that Tuesday. We're a little ahead of the curve because we didn't have an election this semester. Um, so. What are, we, what are we doing today? So just to kind of re, uh, just to do the quick uh, top, of the, top of the class thing, um, you got project six due at the end of the weekend. Object six, your project six is your objects project, and it's going to be just building a bunch of objects as described by the project manual. The project manual does provide UML diagrams, I do believe, so you can use those as a reference, and the written uh, um, descriptions are really only necessary for like the individual methods and their behaviors as opposed to needing to have a block of text to tell you what the instance variables are and whatnot. You have the, you have the UML diagrams to help get that, um, get that down. But yeah, um, we've got that due on uh, Sunday at midnight, and I think that's really everything uh, that we, we've got coming up, other than the normal slog of stuff. we got a quiz tomorrow. Today. That's today. That's Thursday. So yeah, that's the only thing left. Um, okay. Um, so what are we talking about today? We're taking a pivot today, actually. We're not talking about inheritance at all. We're not really talking about objects either. This is kind of an out of left field topic. But I want to say that although it's not directly related to inheritance in the way the past few lectures have been, there is some conceptual overlap, which is why I have pushed this all the way out to the end of our semester. Understanding inheritance doesn't directly help us know exception handling, but it does make the concept go down a little easier, all right? <clears throat> so basically, exception handling is where we're going to start, and it's what we're going to just jump right into. So we've seen exceptions before throughout the semester, but I'm going to introduce them as if we have no concept of what they are and build up from there. So when a program runs into a runtime error, the program just terminates abruptly. All that red text we see in IntelliJ, that's what happens. Now, that's not what a user expects, right? When we're programming our own code, we maybe expect that a little bit. But when, if you're just, say, opening up Microsoft Word to type an essay, you don't expect Microsoft Word to just yeet itself out of existence halfway through your essay. You expect it to stay open until you say to close. So at the same time, though, there do arise circumstances where the program encounters some type of error. So how do we deal with this? How do we handle a runtime error so that the program can continue to run or at the very least terminate gracefully rather than just throwing up the red text and immediately terminating? And the answer to that is exceptions. An exception describes an error caused by your program or external circumstances, and these errors can be caught and handled by your program. So exceptions occur when the program reaches an ambiguous state, so when the program does not know what to do next. So for example, when a scanner object looks for a line of user input, which is not actually there, when trying to access an array at an invalid index, when trying to call a method on a null value. All of these things are you telling the computer to do something and the computer cannot, right? Read the next line. Well, there's no line to read. I don't, I, I don't know what to do, right? Go to this array at index 10. Well, the, the array ends at index five. There is no index 10. What do you want me to do, right? These are situations where the computer really does not know what the next step ought to be. And as we learned way back at the beginning of the semester, you know, computers are big, dumb hunks of silicon. 
The proper quote that's actually art like you know well spoken is computers are fast, accurate, and dumb or stupid, one of the two. And so the idea here is that a computer can't intuit, right? So when the computer reaches a state where what it's being asked to do isn't something it can do, instead of trying to just guess or figure out what the best option is, it just freaks out. It just throws up his hands and says, I can't do that. And so <clears throat> if one statement can't be executed, right? If Java looks at the next line of code and says, I don't know how to do that then all subsequent lines of code can't necessarily be executed because they might rely on the previous statement that wasn't executed. Now, that's not a guarantee. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But the possibility is enough for Java to just freak out. So because there's a possibility that the line that couldn't be executed, the result of that line would be used by subsequent lines, because that possibility exists, when Java encounters a line of program code it doesn't know what to do with, it just freaks out and it quote unquote crashes. All right? But instead of saying crash, we can say an exception occurs. Same thing, we're talking about the same thing, we're just using slightly more technical language. So again, when such a state is reached, Java throws an exception. That's the lingo of the Java programming language. It is throwing an exception. So that's the, that's the process that happens. Java is executing its statements one by one by one, like everything's normal, like everything's fine, and then it encounters a statement it does not know what to do with. Right? You're calling a method on a variable that stores null. You're accessing an array at an index that that array does not have. Java knows what it's being asked to do, cannot do that action, so instead of guessing, it throws an exception. It throws an error. And it basically says, ah, can't do it, right? So it also is nice in that in Java, it actually throws an exception that has details. It tells you what's wrong. It tells you, hey, array index out of bounds exception. And it tells you what line it occurred on, which is actually pretty nice. Some languages, which you will unfortunately all have to deal with before you get out of here, like to say C, don't do that. If C encounters a statement it doesn't know what to do, it prints segmentation fault out and no other information. It doesn't tell you what went wrong, it doesn't tell you why it went wrong, it doesn't tell you where it went wrong. It just says, I couldn't finish the program, Ugh. figure it out. So the fact that Java tells us what's wrong and why and where, even if it's doing so in Java lingo, which admittedly can be dense obtuse and not make a whole lot of sense, the fact that it's trying to point us in the right direction, we love that for us. A lot of languages don't. They're just like, yeah, figure it out, buddy. So anyway, that is an exception, all right? When we think of a crash or an error in Java, the more formal language is that when Java reaches a statement it doesn't know what to do with, it throws an exception. That exception has details explaining what went wrong and where it went wrong. And the idea is the programmer can read that exception and figure out what to fix. Okay, we're we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. So that's all fine and dandy when you are debugging and testing and developing programs, but what happens if you are writing code that you want to give to a user, but that also has the chance for throwing an exception? You know that there might be a circumstance where your code tries to do something that it won't be able to do, and you, instead of wanting your program to crash, want to be able to handle it. Well, the lingo for that is that you can catch a thrown exception. Very baseball we've got going on here. So if an error occurs, an exception is thrown. And if that exception, if you want to deal with that exception, you catch the exception and then put it away and deal with whatever the issue that occurred was. If an exception is thrown and no one catches it, it crashes the program. That's the way it works. So if you know a piece of code has a significant chance of throwing an exception, you can place that code inside of what is called a try block. Every try block is associated with one or more catch blocks. 
catch blocks catch specific exceptions and handle the error. You, the programmer, decide what that means. You specify how you handle the error, but that's the principle, right? If you think a piece of code will throw an exception, you put it in a try block so you can try the code, and if that code throws an exception, you catch it in one of your catch blocks and then deal with the exception. If you have an array index out of bounds exception, you might just, you know, store zero in the variable instead of whatever was at that value, right? Like, who knows? You get to make that up depending on your circumstances. <laughs> Let me just... Do I do that first or do I do that second? Let's do that second. That's fine. We'll introduce it here. So this is what the syntax looks like for this, okay? So we have up here our try block, you know, just the keyword try and opening and closing bracket. We have some statements that might throw exceptions. And then we have catch blocks. This has very similar syntax to our if, else, if logic. It's just instead it's try, catch. You'll notice here that the try block doesn't have any, anything else. It's just try, open, and close, and you put your statements in it. The catch blocks, on the other hand, have specific exceptions. The idea is that you list which exception this block is catching. Okay. So you have to specify what exceptions you expect so that the Java knows which ones to catch. So first we execute code in the try block. If no exceptions are thrown in the try, all the catch blocks are just skipped. Right? Execution jumps to the first statement after the last catch block. Kind of like how if you have if, else, if, else, if, else, if that first if condition is true, all the if, else logic underneath it is just skipped over. Same with the try catch block. If you execute code in the try, and you tried it and it was successful, then you don't need to catch anything, so all that is just skipped. If an exception is thrown, however, the catch block which matches the thrown exception is executed. Okay. Once a catch block is executed, execution jumps to the first statement after the last catch block. So I want to say that again, because that's important. Once a catch block is executed, execution jumps to the first statement after the last catch block. So if you try code and catch the exception, you do not go back and retry the code. Right? You try it, it failed, you caught the error, and then you just move on. That's how this works. So, Okay. I'm going to read the block of text, but I'm going to set it up first. So here on the left-hand side, we have something that's actually kind of a little bit more real. Okay? So if an exception is thrown, the catch block which matches the thrown exception is executed. Now, catch blocks are similar to method declarations. We first define our catch block to take in a single exception of type file not found exception. If the exception is of that type, or excuse me, let's, let's, let's stop right there. I'm going to ignore everything else. So this kind of leads us into an interesting quirk of how Java does things. And this quirk is actually super nice, believe it or not. When Java throws an exception, an exception isn't just some random construct that exists solely for the purpose of being an error. Rather, an exception is an object. An exception is an object whose private data is, roughly speaking, the conditions of the error that occurred. And so the idea for the catch block is that each catch block is kind of like a parameter in a method call because the way Java checks to see if the exception thrown is being caught is by trying to do a variable assignment. What's inside of the parentheses of the catch block is a variable declaration. You are creating a new variable named E of type file not found exception. So it's a specific exception meaning it is a specific type of object, meaning that if you have a file not found exception thrown, 
That means you should be able to do final count exception E equals throw an exception. And that assignment should be valid and allowed. And if it is, then we make the assignment, we store the exception into variable E, and then we go through our error correcting code. Oftentimes variable E, which can be named anything you want, by the way, it's a variable name, you make it up. It's oftentimes called E or exception because that's what it stores. It stores the exception object that was just thrown, but you can call it whatever you want. I'll call it E just so we know what we're talking about. And so variable E very rarely gets used inside of the catch block. You can, I'm sure in, you know, very large complex Java systems it does. But for the type of stuff we're doing in here, pretty much E is just always ignored, but it is good to know that that is the mechanic which is happening. When an exception is thrown, it is a new object. It is an exception object which is thrown, and then a catch is done by trying to ex assign that exception object to what is basically a parameter of type specific exception. And if that assignment is valid, then we take that catch block, and if that assignment is, is invalid, then we go to the next catch block and see if we can do an assignment there. And if that's invalid, we go to the next one, then the next one. And then we do it until we reach an assignment which is valid, or none of the catch blocks catch our exception, and the exception isn't caught, so it keeps traveling, and probably at that point crashes our program. So, if the exception is not of that type, then the catch block is skipped. Okay. So, is that is that still are we still is uh, is uh, no one no one's gone overboard yet, right? Is that still is that making sense, right? Okay, because this is why I waited till after inheritance, because it turns out polymorphism applies here. Let's go back to this first. <clears throat> this is our object hierarchy. We can see all the way down here, we have the object object, the universal object superclass. We have something called probable, which is true, but not relevant. And then we have the exception class. So exception is an object. It is a subclass of object. But exception itself is the universal exception superclass. All exceptions in Java subclass the exception class. So, class not found exception, IO exception, runtime exception are all subclasses of the exception exception. There I go, repeating the same word twice. Love, love that quirk of this class. So, but a runtime exception could also have its own subclasses, right? Arithmetic exceptions or no pointer exceptions or index out of bounds exceptions, those are all runtime exceptions. And they use inheritance to establish this hierarchy. And I actually really, really like this. It is relatively intuitive that you can have narrower and narrower and narrower classifications of exceptions. The most general being the exception exception. More specific is that it's a runtime exception. More specific is than that is that it's an index out of bounds exception. And so we can maintain these categorizations, these levels of specificity using inheritance. So now that we recognize that in exceptions are objects that have inheritance, right, that have superclasses and subclasses. When we think of catch blocks, catching the object exception that is thrown by nature of assigning that exception to variable E, we need to remember that polymorphism applies here. So if the thrown exception is of type file not found exception or any subclass, of file not found exception. The catch block will be executed. Okay. And to make this final point, if you have what this last catch block on the bottom has, which is exception E, exception is the universal exception superclass, meaning if you catch exception E, that'll catch every exception that could possibly be thrown in your try block. Yeah? So you tell the if you're playing a game and it will have some type of error, is that a trap? Yes. If you're playing a game and it has some type of error, try catch blocks. Exception handling is why it doesn't crash and it can deal with the error and move on. That's 100% right. So 
Because exception is the universal exception superclass, a catch exception will catch any exception you want. One important thing to remember about this, though, is this is, again, it's like if, else, if logic. If the trial fails and an exception is thrown, we check each catch block top to bottom. And the first one we find is the one we go with. So if you put exception E, if you put catch exception E as the first catch block, then there's no point in putting other exceptions below it because you'll always catch that any exception with your first catch block because exception E will catch every exception because exception's the universal superclass for exception objects. I said exception too many times there. I'm sorry, that turned into word soup. But that's the idea, right? If you put the exception object as the first thing you're trying to catch, well, then any exception thrown will be caught by that, right? If you're saying the universal exception superclass is checked first, well, then everything is a subclass of that, so it'll catch everything. So when you are catching multiple exceptions, you want to catch them in the order of most specific at the top and most generic at the bottom. Check for your very specific exceptions first, and then check for your generic Oh, and to catch an exception exception and just print out to the user, oh, something weird happened, which uh, I do in a lot of our test cases. And I'm hoping nobody knows that because it means I wrote half decent tests. But if you ever run the test and you get a something weird happened, it's almost certainly because something I didn't expect happened and I do catch exception. And I just catch that general exception and I just output, oh, contact your instructor. Let me look at your code and wonder why mine doesn't work. But like, that's how it works, all right? That's a try-catch block. Lastly, we have the finally clause. So basically, if you want code to be executed, regardless of whether an exception was or was not thrown, the finally clause goes at the end of the catch statements and will always execute, regardless of whether the try was or was not successful. So that's it, by the way. That's everything there is to catching and handling exceptions. It's just the try-catch block. There is no other mechanisms at play here. Okay? Um, so that's try-catch block. So the other side of that coin are throwing exceptions. So if an exception occurs, we know how to deal with it. But if an exception should occur, how do we create one? An example. Sorry, there's like robotics happening upstairs and I can hear all these weird copy machine noises. So that's the distraction reason. That's, that's why. Um, but basically, when it comes to, there are times where you want to throw an exception. For example, our original playing card object, right? We use the uh, setter methods of our playing card object to verify if the given string was a valid string. And if not, we wanted to crash the program, i.e. we wanted to throw an exception. Okay. So in order to do this, typically example one is what it does. Throw new the exception. You have parentheses here because again, exceptions are objects. So you are constructing a new exception object and then using the throw keyword to get it into the system. All right, you're creating a new exception object and then throwing it so that it either gets caught by someone or it crashes the program. So this, public void set radius. You give in a radius. If radius is greater than zero, then fine. Else, throw a new illegal argument exception. Radius cannot be negative. And note the name, illegal argument exception. It is explicitly telling you that the argument provided to this method was illegal, bad, not allowed. It tells you that's why the program crashed. Now again, if we got this week three, I wouldn't expect anyone to know what the hell this was talking about. But like, as we go through the semester, we start to recognize some of these terms. And it's not that it's just going to click automatically, but I do want to kind of challenge us to try and stitch these together a little bit. Right? Get comfortable trying to decipher the error message because it's probably not going to make sense most of the time, but you'd be surprised how many times when you sit down and you think about what each word is trying to say, 
that you'll be like, oh, okay, I think I sort of know what Idis is mad about. Like, if you, if you challenge yourself to read those exceptions through, you might be surprised with how much you're, you pick up. Um, but that's the idea of doing it. In theory, you can catch an exception just to rethrow it, but that's kind of insane and unhinged behavior, so I'm not going to talk about it further. Okay, <clears throat> so we, that, that's really it for exceptions. It's just there's one tangent related to exceptions that we need to cover that, are, that is vital, and that is the difference between checked and unchecked exceptions. Okay, runtime exceptions are known as unchecked exceptions. All other exceptions are known as checked exceptions, meaning the compiler forces you to check and deal with them. So in most cases, unchecked exceptions reflect programming logic errors that are not recoverable and shouldn't be there, all right? I.e., unchecked exceptions are almost always because the programmer did something wrong and the programmer should just fix it. So the Java compiler does not force you to catch these exceptions because these are really here to be a warning to the programmer that their code is bad. Like if you get a null pointer exception, there's really not much you can do to fix that. The point of the null pointer exception is for you to recognize, oh, I wrote bad code, let me go fix that. Thus, Java doesn't force you to check if these exceptions, you know, to try and, tr Java doesn't make you try and catch these exceptions because Java's belief is that you shouldn't catch these exceptions. If you see them, you should fix your code so that those exceptions never get thrown in the first place. An unchecked exception doesn't need to be caught because an unchecked exception shouldn't ever occur. It will, but that's a bug and you go fix it. Right? That's kind of the premise here. If it's an unchecked exception, that means it's on you, the programmer, to figure out where you screwed up and go fix your code. That's the like logic behind it. But checked exceptions are different. Java forces you to deal with checked exceptions, okay? Okay. If a method can throw a checked exception, you must invoke it in a try-catch block and it not doing so will cause a compile time error. So before I get into the questions posed by this slide, I wanna take a quick detour to ask ourselves, okay, if unchecked exceptions are things the programmer should fix, what would be a checked exception, right? What would that be like? So for example, a checked exception might be something like this. Say you wanna open a file to read its contents into your program. And in order to do that, you ask the user for a file path, okay? Now, if the user provides an invalid file path, right, like it's a path that does not point to a valid file, then the program cannot function, right? If you say, hey, read the data in file X, and you don't point to file X, you point to nothing, then there's nothing that can be done, right? Your, your program has to crash. But is that really the fault of your code? Is that the fault of you, the programmer? No, right? You wrote all the good code to take in a file path and read the data from that file. You didn't have any issues. The code is great, but the user put in a bad file path. Nothing you can really do about that now, is there? And that is the prime reason for a checked exception. There are plenty of circumstances in which something in your program goes wrong, but it's not really the programmer's fault. Right, programmer wrote great, stellar, flawless code, but then we're given a piece of bad input data. So it doesn't matter how good your code is, if your code needs to know where a specific file is and is given bad information as to where it is, your program cannot successfully execute no matter what the hell it does, and that's not your fault as a programmer. Nothing you can do to stop that from happening. So that is where we have checked exceptions, okay? Checked exceptions are for when you have situations where something could go wrong and it's kind of out of your control as a programmer. That's what checked exceptions are for. <clears throat> so with that kind of being established, how do we know if a method can even throw a checked exception? 
How do we indicate a method we made can throw a checked exception? So how now? The answer, the throws keyword. And yes, it does mean Java has two separate keywords, throw and throws. Love that for us, but if the, the, the English subtlety actually does work here. For once, I don't hate this naming convention. The throw is a verb. To throw is to take an exception object and yeet that into the system. Throws is an adjective, I think. <laughs> Not an English major. But basically, throws is a descriptor of the method it's applied to. So throw is an action, throws is a description. And that's how you should keep them apart, even though they're only a character different. So every method must state the type of checked exceptions it might throw. And this is done using the throws keyword. The syntax is after the uh, parameters, after the closing parenthesis of your parameter list, but before your opening bracket, you put the throws keyword and then list the checked exceptions separated by commas. The throws keyword passes the responsibility for catching a checked exception from the method to the caller of the method. Okay. So throws, again, to reiterate, throws is there to indicate that your method can throw a checked exception. Checked exceptions need to be put in a try block and caught. Right? The compiler forces you to do that. And so, really what the throws keyword is, is it is the passing of responsibility. It is basically an omission saying, hey, I can't handle this checked exception. Whoever called me, they have to handle it instead. <clears throat> so that's the idea, right? It's, it's a matter of this checked exception needs to be dealt with. So whose job is it, right? If you don't put the throws keyword on your method, and you're, you're using something that can throw a checked exception, the idea is that you will put the offending code in a try-catch block inside of your method. But there are times where there's nothing your method can do. So say, for example, we go back to what I was just talking about, right? A checked exception might occur because your perfectly good code requires the user to input a file path, and then it will read the data in from that file. So let's just add a little bit of detail to that. Let's imagine that we have a main method and a second method. The main method does all the user input stuff. The second method opens the file. So this open file method takes in a string that's a file path and tries to open up the file, however the hell it does that. Now, let's assume that the file path the user gave us is bad. So let's think through this. We're in the main method. We ask the user for a pop file path. They give us one. We go down to the open file method, given the file path as a parameter, and then we try and open up the file. And it fails. An exception is thrown. The question I have is, can the open file do anything about that? If we tried to catch the exception in open file, is there anything open file can do? And the answer is no, not really. Because open file was given a parameter. And that parameter was bad. But open file doesn't talk to the user. Open file doesn't have any way to correct that file path. All open file can do is throw the exception to whoever called open file and hope that they are capable of handling it. Right? That is an example of when a method is reasonably passing the responsibility of catching that exception. It's passing the responsibility from itself to someone else, whoever called it. Okay? And we do that when we can't catch, we, when we can't handle the exception reasonably where it currently occurred. Right? So if you're in the open file method and you were given the file path as a parameter, if that parameter is bad, there's nothing your method can really do other than just print out a oops kind of error message. Right? It's, it can't fix its parameter input. So it will throw the exception. But the main method, the main method could catch that exception 
And because the main method's doing user input, it could catch like the file not found exception and then print out to the user, oi, that's not a valid file. Wanna try that again? And then maybe it's in a loop, right? It jumps back up to the top, asks the user for a file path again, and then it calls open file. And if that file's bad again, you go to open file, open file tries to open that file, throws a file not found exception, that goes from open file to the main method, the main method catches that exception and prints out again to the user, oi, bad file path, try again. Right? And we're stuck in this loop until the user figures it out and puts in a correct file path. And then we can continue on with our code. Whew, that's the idea here. <clears throat> and I wanna say one last thing about this before I move on. If the throws keyword is passing the responsibility of dealing with the exception from you to whoever called you, then, then in this context, the main method is like the president of the United States. The buck stops there. I'm pulling out a Truman reference. It's not really how it works in 2024, but hey, let's pretend, shall we? Um, the, the idea here is that the main method is the end all be all. The main method has to catch everything. Because who calls the main method? The system. And is the system gonna catch any of your exceptions? No, absolutely not. System does not have time for your exception nonsense. It's doing system things. So basically putting the throws keyword on the main method is a surrender. It's an admission of defeat. It is basically saying, yeah, go crash my program. See if I care. And you do. <laughs> but that's what the throws keyword is. It's tantamount. If you, the throws keyword on the main method is tantamount to surrender. You're just accepting that this exception will just happen and fuck up your program and you're not going to do a thing about it. It sometimes helps things compile, but that is what you are doing. You are giving up on catching and dealing with the exception and you're saying, yeah, throw it to the system and knowing full well the system's just gonna let it crash the whole program. So you should never do that, is my moral here. If you put the throws keyword on the main method, you have done something wrong, even if it compiles. Hell, even IntelliJ will suggest this sometimes. Because IntelliJ is kind of smart, but it's also kind of dumb, okay? so. This is why I like to be very <laughs> over-animated. I feel like I'm channeling Jim Carrey sometimes. Um, but like, the idea here <clears throat> is that we want to kind of really enforce this principle that like, it's not just about getting code that will compile, it's about getting code that actually works. It's getting code that we understand the choices we've made within it. Because at the end of the day, y'all are here at this institution, a lot of you here to get a computer science degree, so that is the level of depth that separates you from just some guy who learned coding over a summer. Like truly, the difference between I just got it to compile and it doesn't crash right now with my three pieces of test data and someone who understands the underlying system well enough to be like, this is dumb. We should not do it this way. It will probably be fine, but this is kind of risky, right? That is the difference. And that's why I like to emphasize these system things rather than just being like, oh, it'll compile, don't worry. But I got, I got more to talk about, so I'm gonna stop tangenting. Um, so just to kind of continue on that track, an exception occurs in your method. What do? Well, it depends. The classic computer science answer, it depends. Basically, can your method deal with the exception reasonably or can it not? If it can deal with the exception, put it in a try-catch block. If it can't deal with the exception, put the throws keyword on your method and have whoever called your method deal with that problem. That's the kind of, that's, that's, your, that's, your, that's the debate. If you know your method executes code that will throw a checked exception, you have to choose whether your method can reasonably catch that exception or if whoever called your method has to be the one to deal with. Basically, don't overuse exceptions. And what I mean by this is most of the time, checked exceptions, you have to use try-catch blocks and that's normal and fine. But there are gonna be circumstances, particularly with unchecked exceptions, where you could theoretically do something like this. Try to, pre try to, try to call toString on ref var and catch a null pointer exception. Ref var is null. Don't do this. 
there's a lot of reasons. It's slow, it's hacky, and if you do this on a code review or for a job interview, they're gonna probably be mean about it. <laughs> Basically, pretty much all unchecked exceptions can be dealt with using non-exception handling logic. Like, if you want to check if a variable isn't null, just use an if statement. Okay? I don't think this is a huge struggle point. Typically, I think it's relatively quick to pick up when to use an exception and when not to. But basically, if you're ever not sure, should I use an exception here or not, defer to not. You should only use an exception if you really don't have any other options. If there is a way to identify the potential issue without calling, without using try catch blocks, you should. Okay? Only use exceptions if you have to. And I will admit there are one or two, one in particular, cases in this course where it feels like you shouldn't need to, but you do because Java kind of sucks. But that's its own story. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Exception handling separates error handling code from normal programming tasks, thus making programs easier to read and modify. Beware, however, that exception handling usually requires more time and resources. I don't typically talk about efficiency in this class. It's not really our concern. But basically, exception handling is just so much more computationally expensive than everything else that even though it's not our main focus, I still need to alert you of that just so we understand why exceptions are a tool of last resort. They get used often enough, right? The exception is going to crash your program. We use the tool of last resort relatively often, but it should always be a tool of last resort. Using it when there's another option means that, we're, that there's a better option, right? Exception handling is always the worst way to solve a problem, so we only use it if it's the only way to solve a problem. Okay. Now, I, I, I struck through this info because it's not relevant to the course, but it is correct, so I'll just say it because I can't help myself. Basically, exception handling takes a lot of time and resources because it requires instantiating a new exception object. It also is going to roll back the call stack and propagate these errors to the methods which called it. Basically, creating a new object and then doing stuff with the call stack, i.e. all those memory diagrams each method gets, that's just a lot of computational stuff. Making the object, going to the call stack, talking to each individual method, seeing can you catch this exception? No, get you off the call stack. Can you catch this exception? Like that's, that's just a lot of computational stuff happening as opposed to like, if ref var not equal null. That's just one instruction, that's one statement, that's easy peasy. An exception is like, can you catch this exception? Like it's just, it's a lot more work. So that's why we don't want to use exceptions, okay? You can, exceptions are objects. You can create a new exception object which subclasses the exception superclass. I mean, don't. The Java API provides you with so many exceptions that literally everything you need is already there. But if you really feel like you need a special exception just for you, it's easy to do. It's just like making a new object because exceptions are, in fact, objects. Just like that. Cool. That's exceptions. Any questions about exception handling, try catch block? Seems a little too early, doesn't it? I regret to inform you that it, in fact, is too early. This is a two-part lecture. I know, save your applause for later. But we can talk about file I.O. now. And this isn't going to be as bad as it might seem because we will have actually seen a number of the concepts in this lecture before, and we'll have worked with them before. So let's jump into it. For the record, when I say text I.O., I.O. is short. It's an abbreviation for input-output. So reading from a file and writing to a file. Let's not just assume everyone knows what that means. So the file class is intended to provide an abstraction 
that deals with the machine dependent complexities of files and path names. Um, the file name is a string. The file class is a wrapper class for the file name and its directory path. Um, okay, I don't care. Basically, basically, what I'll say here is that for like files, right? If you want to read and write to a file, basically the file object doesn't let you do any of that. The file object is literally just there as a convenient way to represent a file in Java, okay? So instead of you having to deal with file paths all the time, which trust me, are nightmares beyond typical comprehension. File paths are the worst. Some things, some things you expect to be a nightmare, like time. If you start thinking about the system of human time and time zones and leap seconds, it's a pretty cumbersome nightmare system. It makes sense why programmers don't like programming in time. But when we think about file paths, it's a relatively straightforward concept. It's just a string listing all the directories and subdirectories from the beginning of the hard drive until we get to our file. Shouldn't be that hard to implement, right? And yet, file paths are just notorious for just not working for mystery reasons all the damn time. They're just really annoying for like when they shouldn't be. So they're kind of like sneaky annoying, right? You think it's pretty easy because on the surface it should be pretty easy, but for some reason, uh, they're just way more finicky than they ever should be. So instead of dealing with the literal strings, most of the time we're going to just deal with file objects. Any, any constructor for an object that's going to read and write data from a file is going to take in a file object rather than a string file path. Your methods in the labs and projects that will deal with you know, file input output will take in file objects themselves so that things are a little easier on y'all's end. So that's all a file object is. It's just a wrapper for the file. It can't actually do anything with the file. It's just a wrapper for easy use with other Java constructs. So with that being said, let's start with reading data. If I want to read data from a file, how am I going to do that? So first, I'm going to make a file object. But once I have a file object, what object am I going to use to read data from the file? And this is the part I like. We already know how to read data from a file. We do. Because the way you read data from a file is a scanner. The only difference here is that instead of the scanner we used the first half of the semester, where the argument to the scanner constructor is, yes, yeah, scanner is an object, instead of it being system.in, i.e., the system's input, the keyboard, we give it an input of input file, which is the file object I made up here. So if we want to read data in from a file, we create a file object and then use that file object to create a scanner. And the scanner object works the exact same way that scanner has always worked. While in dot has next line, string line equals in dot next line. That's how you read data from a file. You just use the scanner the same way we read in user data from, a fi uh, from, from like the console the whole first half of the semester. Nothing new there, to be honest. Okay. So <clears throat> one thing I will say, um, <clears throat> we've talked about this before, but I will, specify, I will try and tailor this specifically to files. Basically, many data files are comma separated so we've used the split method before, I believe, but I will reiterate here. You can read the file data in line by line and then parse the line using the string method split. So string line equals in dot next line, string array tokens equals line dot split. This is actually just a very common um, thing. Basically, it's very common for data to be stored as comma separated values. The idea that each value is on a line separated by a comma, and then after the comma is the next value, and then the next, and then the next. And so if you take in each line and break each line up by the commas, each resulting array element will be its own single piece of data. OK? 
comma, separated values, particularly for those of you who are in bioinformatics, CSV files, and you load up in Excel, comma, separated values. If you actually open up a CSV file in your text editor, you'll see that. It's just all your data separated by commas. And this is how your programs, and frankly how Excel, you know, breaks that data apart and then puts it on a display for you. So, this, so we have the split method. The split method takes in a string that lists all the characters you want to use as delimiters, i.e. characters to break your string apart on. Um, again, you can also pass the string a regular expression. Um, I don't care what a regular expression is. Regular expression is a bunch of meta symbols which describe a set of potential characters. Um, it can be pretty powerful but it's not really relevant to this course. You'll learn about that in your other courses. But what I will, ooh, nice catch. I literally said nice catch to myself and then dropped the fucking remote. Love that for me. But basically, right, what we have here with the regular expressions is that the string that you give to the split method is potentially a regular expression. So if you're using IntelliJ and dot .split, suggests that the name of your argument is regex in like that kind of light gray text that IntelliJ sometimes uses. Regex is short for regular expression and that's why it's named that way. We're not really using regular expressions if we just put a character or a set of characters that works totally fine and we don't need to worry about it, but that's why the name is there. Okay. This isn't particularly relevant to file. Well, it is, but it's a bit of a tangent, which again, we've seen, and it's converting strings to numbers. So a lot of times, if you're reading in data from a file, it's gonna come in as string information. And if you store a bunch of numbers, you're gonna need to convert those numbers from strings of characters to an integer or a decimal number that you can you know, interact with. Now, the way we do this, again, I have mentioned this once or twice before, is the parse int and parse double methods. Integer.parseInt takes in a string of int characters and returns the integer that it represents. Parse double is the same, but just for a double or real number. Now, the argument to parse int slash parse double must be a string containing only digits with the decimal point allowed for doubles, of course. No spaces are even allowed. Any miss, any incorrect non-numeric characters will break the uh, parse int, parse double methods. <coughs> so it's often recommended, <coughs> it's often recommended to use the trim method on the input string. So trim gets rid of any leading and trailing white space. So just in case there's any left over, you get rid of it. But what happens if even after trimming, the input data you give isn't a valid number. Sometimes this happens. Sometimes you read in, say, a big old data file with uh, thousands and thousands of data entries. And maybe someone over the years screwed up one of those entries. Right? All the entries are supposed to be numbers, but one or two of them have a letter in them because somebody just made a mistake. Right? It happens. Very human. We make mistakes. That's something you should be okay with. But what's going to happen in our code, right? If we have a string that has a letter in it accidentally and we pass it to parse int, well, it's going to crash our program. More though than crash our program, it's going to throw an exception. So how do we safely parse numbers from strings? Unfortunately, this. Remember how I just said don't use exceptions unless you absolutely have to? Unfortunately, the only way to verify if a string is or is not a valid number is to just try to convert it, and if it fails, catch the specific exception that gets thrown. This is bad. I don't like this, but this is the only option Java gives us. So, you know, 07 to us, I guess. We just gotta deal with it. So that's what this is gonna look like. You try to convert the value to an integer, and if it fails, catch the number format exception that occurs and do something about it. Typically, and this will be the case for your projects in this course, if you're reading in large swaths of data values, 
you either skip the invalid value or you replace it with, say, a zero. You know, again, how you handle the errors is very context dependent, which is why we're not getting into too much detail about them here. Really, we're talking more about the try-catch structure. So, lengthy little tangent about dealing with numbers aside, that's how we read the data in from a file. We just use a scanner. We create a file object, create a new scanner, given that file, and then that scanner will read the file line by line rather than, say, user input line by line. So any questions about that process? Okay. So this is a two-way street, right? We're reading in data, sure, but what if we want to go the other direction? So unfortunately, if we want to write data out to a file, we're going to need to learn a new object. It's called the print writer object, and it takes in a file. That's the file you're going to write data out to, and you create it all the same. But uh, we've never seen print writer before, but I lied, we kind of have. Because while we have not seen print writer before, print writer is a subclass of print stream, I think. And print writer is a subclass of print stream. And you know what else is a subclass of print stream? System.out. And so, with a print writer object, although it is a new object, we can use the print writer methods such as print, print ln and print f that we've used with system.out the entire semester. Want to write data out to a file? Print writer dot print line or print writer dot print f. And then we'll print to the file. Okay, I really should say out dot print ln and out dot print f. You know, this is an object. You're invoking these methods on a variable of type print writer, which stores an instantiated slash created print writer object pointing to a specific file. Okay. But yeah, that's really all that's really all there is. Now print writer's a little quirky here. If the output file exists, it's emptied, and if it does not exist at all, it'll be created. Um, and yeah. Oh, print stream. Did I get that right? Did I say print stream? I might have. I did? Hey, good for me. Look at that. I pulled something out of my head and it was actually correct. That would be... We love to see it. Okay. Oh, that's all wishwash anyway. There's a few things after this, but what I'm going to say here is the last very big important thing I want to mention. We saw when we worked with scanners at the first chunk of the semester, there was an option for closing your scanner. When you were done with the scanner, you could close it up, basically tell Java you were done using the scanner, and move on. And we like never did that. It didn't really matter. And that's cool. That's fine. It, it doesn't need to matter. But print writers can also be closed. And print writers need to be closed. They need it. And let me explain why. Let's take a, let's take a journey. We're, we're, we're pulling the curtain back a little bit more than we need to, but I like this. I teach 311. This is the type of stuff I like talking about. So, sorry. But basically, when writing data to a file, what you're doing is you're writing data to typically the hard drive, right? the thing that stores all of your data long term. And for the purpose of this story, all you really need to know is that the journey from our CPU executing the code to the hard drive storing our data takes, relatively speaking, forever. The journey from the CPU to the hard drive takes eons in CPU time, right? CPUs go super fast, so not in absolute terms, but like in terms of the CPU, it can execute so many statements before it can send a piece of data to the hard drive and get a confirmation that it was in fact received by the hard drive. That is basically the equivalent of me having to like, I'd say walk across town, but it's really like walk to Henrico. You know, it's the difference between me going up to my office to talk to the CPU and having to walk to Henrico to go write a piece of data to the hard drive. Like it's that extreme, like truly. And so as a result, every time you write data to a file, 
to literally write data every single time you ask the computer to do it would be super inefficient. You'd be making a super long journey to the hard drive every single time. And that isn't something that the computer wants to do. It's inefficient, it's slow. And so to get around this, the way print writer works in specific is it does not write all your lines at once. Rather than every write <clears throat> going to the hard drive when it happens, <clears throat> writes all pile onto a bus. So imagine there's a school bus or the pulse, and we're going to, I should just use the pulse from the beginning, it's a great example. Um, but it's, imagine we have a pulse, right? And so the idea here is that every time there's a write, the write gets onto the bus. And when and only when the bus is full, does the bus depart the CPU station, drive down to the hard drive, <coughs> and let out all of its um, fares? That's taxi. Whatever, all of its passengers, right? So all the rights get onto a big old bus, and when the bus is full, that journey goes from the CPU to the hard drive. So even when your code says write this line to a file, that line's not actually written until there's enough writes for the bus to leave the station and go to the hard drive. Okay, cool. But what happens if the bus is half full and the program is over? What do? Now, that is why you need to close your print writer. If your print writer doesn't close and you written stuff, and all those writes are on the bus, and the bus never leaves CPU station, and your program ends, then all the writes your program has been doing don't actually get written to the hard drive. They just vanish. And it just looks like your code just doesn't work. And it doesn't, but it's kind of going to drive you a little insane. Like, no, wait, I wrote this. Like, I know this code executed because these print statements before and after it printed to the console. But when I do print, like, out.write, and I run the program, and then I look at the output file, there's no data in it. What the hell is going on? And the answer is, what's happening is your write is getting onto the bus, and then your program ends, and the bus never leaves CPU station, so the write never actually happens. So what the hell does closing the print writer have to do with any of this? Well, when you close a uh, print writer, that sends a signal to the bus, hey, last call, last call, everybody. If the bus isn't full, doesn't matter. Take your half or quarter filled bus and drive it down to hard drive. There's no more passengers a coming. Program is over. And so that's why you always, always, always need to close your print writer. To make a long story very short, if you don't close the print writer, your, your writes won't actually get written. But if you do close the print writer, your writes will be written regardless of how many writes you've made. Okay? I hope the long magic school bus-esque uh, analogy uh, is helpful. Okay? But that's how that works. And again, not that it's strictly necessary, I just find that I would rather give a little bit of a long-winded explanation that can be kind of passed by, shall we say, as opposed to just saying, you need to close it so that the rights get written, and then just leave it at that. Like, I really don't like just obfuscating information that we have the knowledge to grapple with. We don't need to, it's kind of just there if you want it, if you want to see a more complete picture of what's going on, but I find that that understanding helps us better understand the decisions that were made, why the language looks a certain way, why other programs behave a certain way. It just provides an understanding and a context to so much more, and it just makes it a lot easier to understand why things are the way they are. At least that's my hot take for the afternoon. Um, okay. Final few things. Um, one additional issue is that <clears throat> if the input or output file for a scanner or print writer does not exist, a file not found exception occurs. What? Scanner doesn't need an. Okay, whatever. Basically, print writers and scanners can throw file not found exceptions. 
If you try and redid it in through a scanner from a file which isn't there, you're going to find that found exception. PrintWriter will create its own file, but if you try and tell PrintWriter to make a file in like a directory or a folder that PrintWriter is not allowed to make a file in, it will also throw a file not found exception. File not found exceptions are checked exceptions. So if we want to create a scanner object that reads from a file or create a PrintWriter object that writes to a file, both of those constructors will either need to be in a try catch block or have the throws keyword on whatever method they're in. Hint, well, no. Just hint, if the print writer slash scanner is in your main method, this isn't a question. The answer is try catch block, right? Because again, don't put throws on the main method. But if you are creating a print writer or a scanner object for a file, outside of the main method, that's a question you've got to ask yourself. So for example, I already kind of did this example. Well, what? Oh, I, I don't like that. I don't like that. <clears throat> Ignore the try finally stuff. It wants to really make sure the scanner is closed. It doesn't really matter. But the main premise here is this is the open file, or in this case, read file method I was talking about earlier. Here, we have a method called readFile, which takes in a file object as its input. And it uses the throws keyword because if it tries to create this scanner object using the inFile parameter, and the inFile parameter does not have a valid file object, there's really nothing scanner can do. Right? Scanner received the parameter, it didn't make any sense, and that's really the end of the line. So we use the throws keyword on the uh, read file method so that anyone calling read file has to be responsible for catching the exception thrown if the um, in file is invalid. Okay. This is what it might look like in the, tri in the main method. So again, as I said at the start of this lecture, right, when, a try, when you try code and an exception is thrown and you catch the exception, you start executing the code at the end of the try block, or at the, at, like after the try catch blocks. You do not go back to the try. And so in circumstances where you want to try something, if it fails, you catch the exceptions and then try it again, you put that code inside of a while loop. Right? Try catch blocks by their nature, go to the end of the catch blocks and then continue off afterwards regardless of the circumstances. But if you want to retry something, you can just put the try catch inside of a loop, which is what this code does here. Boolean done equals false while not done. Try double array data equals read file, and then done equals true. Done equals true is the last line in the try block, meaning if we execute done equals true, no exceptions were thrown. Whereas if an exception is thrown by the read file method, we'll never execute done equals true, and we'll repeat this loop. That's the paradigm we're using here. And so if an exception is thrown, we'll try and catch a file not found exception, a no such element exception, or then just a generic IO exception. And you actually can even see it's, again, subtlety, but I like it. The file not found exception has an actual error. File not found, it tells you what's wrong. No such element exception tells you what's wrong. File content's invalid. But a generic IO exception just prints out the stack trace, i.e. all the red text that you see in IntelliJ, because basically it's saying, hey, I'll catch an IO exception, I'll make sure it doesn't crash the program, but I have no idea what the hell just happened here. Here's the entire stack trace, here's everything about the exception I know, see if you can figure it out. This is very much a, ooh, kind of piece of code. Better to shrug your shoulders and not crash the program than have your program crash, but this is very much a, this shouldn't happen, but just in case it does. Um, I guess, I guess read data, because if in dot has next after all the values it expected were read, it could throw an end of file accepted, it could throw an exception about it. I guess that's fair. We won't come into that this semester, but in theory, if you're reading data from a file and that file should have a specific number of lines and it has more lines than that, you can throw an exception, right? Normally that seems excessive, but there are some times where 
if the file has more data than it's supposed to have that indicates something is very wrong with the file, and it's better to throw an exception rather than just being, well, I'm sure it's fine. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it really is better to, um, to, be, to be like this. Okay. Ow. And that's really it. All those slides I just skipped over, Indulge me two minutes of rambling, if you will. Basically, it used to be back in the day that websites were made up of what is called HTML, hypertext markup language, and that the content of the web page were pretty much visible just by looking at the source code of the web page. You could just see how everything was marked up, what the text was, where it was shifted, and that's what this project web crawler is really designed for. The idea is you go to a URL, like a location online, it renders a web page, you look at all of the markup dictating what text goes where, what images go where, what you know, borders and blocks go where, and you can consume all that data and parse it and really kind of, you know, take the information on the web page and store it as like a, a string and then save it to a file, which is really cool. But unfortunately, the modern web does not work like that. The modern web is no longer the uh, simple dream of the 90s. It doesn't just have a bunch of ugly boxes with text in them. Around the 2000s, we were like, what if we had curves? Which is not the hugest problem. There is a thing called CSS which basically takes this, these cute boxes and it adds curves and pretty colors and other fancy things, which makes websites much harder to understand but makes them much prettier. And that's not even a big deal, that's fine. But as we get into the 2010s and into the 2020s, a lot of websites don't actually work like that anymore. A lot of websites, when you go to the web page, have code that runs in your web browser, and this code programmatically renders the web page and just displays it to you. So rather than your web browser reading in a bunch of, here's this text and put it over here, here's this text, put it over here, your web browser reads in a little program and it just runs that program. And that program is responsible for drawing everything, which basically means you can't access a lot of that data. A lot of that data is, if you look at the source code, you don't see any of the text on your screen, you just see a bunch of JavaScript, which has nothing to do with Java, by the way. Just called that. Um, and so, yeah, unfortunately, uh, the web kind of got like that over the years. Not to mention most social media companies is where all of their collective internet is going and they don't let you do stuff like this because huh, if you can just take their data, why would you go on their site? And if you're not going on their site, how can they sell you ads and how can they trap you into the algorithm? Um, <clears throat> they can't, so they don't let you do this stuff anymore. The internet kind of got consumed by like four social media companies. Um, like seriously, everything's a Reddit link or a Facebook link or a TikTok link or a YouTube link. And what the hell else is there? Twitter? <laughs> yeah, okay. Kind of sucks, man. I kind of do miss the dream of the original internet. The idea that everyone just would have their own little personal web page that they would be in control of in small little local communities of people online. So we are all interconnected with everybody, which has its perks, but it has a lot of downsides. I think we all know those firsthand. Anyway, I'm gonna get off my soapbox and end class like two minutes early today. Thank you so much for being here. Tuesday's gonna be a demo, and then next Thursday is gonna be a little bit more lecture. And then uh, don't forget, our final exam is gonna be on our last day of class, which is the last day of class is. Um, and so we're gonna finish stuff up, have another project and another lab, and uh, yeah, we're kind of in the home stretch. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. Uh, stay dry out there. I'll see you back here next week. Um, and have a good weekend. Bye, everybody.